Hey, it's Melissa Parker. We're going to go ahead and go over the preschool child, which is going to be found in chapter 18 of your pediatric books. So in what ways has a preschool child refined his or her motor, social and cognitive skills compared to toddlers? So that's kind of what we're going to be going over here today. Um, so preschool child, um, they are going to be between age three to five years of age. A um, preschool child has a has good control of their muscles and they participate in vigorous play. They become more adept at using already familiar skills as each year passes. They can swing, they can jump higher. Their gait resembles that of an adult. They are quicker and have more self-confidence than they did as a toddler. So um, the preschool age is marked by the slowing down of physical growth and then also mastering and refining of their motor skills and their cognitive abilities. Major tasks of a preschool age child is to prepare to enter school, the development of cooperative type play, so that's like playing house or playing school. They control, um, they're able to control their body functions. Um, they have acceptance of separation from their parents. They have an increase in their communication skills. They have memory and they're starting to have more of an attention span. Um, so Piaget, when we think of Piaget, we should be thinking about cognitive development. So Piaget is the pre-operational phase. So two to four year old child, they're very intuitive um, thought um, by the time they reach five to seven years of age. So what this means is pre-operational. So if you were looking at this picture right here with this young child, um, you can see that there's two glasses that have the equal amount of fluid in them. If we were to pour one of those glasses into one, the fluid into that tall glass, it would appear to be higher um, as far as tall, uh, how tall it is compared to one of the other glasses. So in the pre-operational phase, if we were to pour the fluid into the tall glass and it were to appear as if there was more because of how tall it is, that is a pre-operational thought process. Um, somebody that has intuitive thought will, would be able to recognize that just because we poured the fluid that's in the short, fatter glass into the tall, thinner glass, it's still the same amount of fluid, whereas the pre-operational phase is going to think that just because the fluid appears to be taller, that there's going to be more inside of that glass. So Piaget labels this um, intuitive thought because he believed that children at this stage tend to be so certain of their knowledge and understanding that they're unaware of how they gained this knowledge in the first place. Um, so Piaget also suggested that intuitive thinking children show a style of thinking that he called centration. So this means that they can only focus on one characteristics of the uh, of that particular object. So these children typically hone in on one characteristic of someone or something and base their decision judgment on that particular characteristics rather than considering multiple characteristics. Physical development. Um, so they it doubles their one year old weight by five years of age and between three to six years of age they grow taller and they lose their chubbiness from that toddler age. All 20 primary teeth have erupted. They have good control of their muscles. Uh, they are starting to develop hand preferences between three years of age or by three years of age. They're more adept at using old skills as each year passes. The three-year-old. Three-year-olds um, are helpful and they can assist in some household chores. Their temper tantrums are starting to slow down. They're less frequent. They're better able to direct primitive instincts. They can help dress themselves, use the toilet, wash their hands, and eat independently. They talk in longer sentences and they're able to express thoughts and also ask questions. Uh, play is loosely associated in groups. They're highly, they have highly imaginative play. 
Um, they begin to lose interest in their mother and prestige of the father begins. They develop romantic attachments to the parent of the opposite gender. So sometimes you'll hear them say when they grow up, they want to marry mommy or they want to marry daddy. Um, identify themselves with the parent of the same gender. Um, so a three-year-old has a vocabulary of approximately 300 to 800 words. They use plurals. Um, they form three word sentences and can repeat three numbers. Understanding occurs before their expressive language begins. So they're able to understand more than they can share um, verbally with you. Discuss how a three-year-old's imagination is different from a school age child. Well, they still have a lot of imaginative play. Um, Kohlberg is, this is the beginning of the moral development. So why do they choose to do what they do? Is it because they don't want to be punished? Is it because they uh, want to be recognized or to please a parent? So three-year-olds, they become angry when someone tries to take their possessions. They resent being disrupted during play. So when they're doing something and you're, it's going to be dinner time or it's time to leave for from the park, we need to make sure we give them a warning. Uh, they're sensitive and their feelings get easily hurt. And from a nurse perspective, one thing that we want to recognize is that they have fear of bodily harm. So four-year-olds, they're more aggressive. They're eager to let others know that they're superior. Um, they pick on their playmates. They're boisterous. They like to tattle on others. They can use scissors with success, and they can tie their shoes. Um, so even though they can tie their shoes, um, by the end of them being four years of age, some four-year-olds cannot tie their shoes. So it may be because they've had Velcro shoes and just haven't had the opportunity to learn to do so. Vocabulary has increased to about 1,500 words. Many feats are done for a purpose. Um, they begin to prefer playing with friends that are the same gender. Uh, they'll use four to five word sentences. They like to experiment with language and words, so you have, make sure you model uh, appropriate language in front of them. And they may use offensive words without even understanding what they mean. Um, the four-year-old, um, their concept of death um, is not quite understood. Um, so they begin to wonder about death and dying. They realize that others die, but they do not relate death to themselves. Parents should reassure children that people do not generally die until they've lived a really long life. Parents should encourage questions as they appear and help the child accept the truth about death without fear. Uh, the five-year-old, they're more responsible. They enjoy doing what is expected of them. They have more patience. They tend to want to finish whatever it is they start. They talk constantly and they're very inquisitive. They like to ask why. Um, so by this age, they have a vocabulary of 2,000 words and they can name four colors and they'll use six to eight word sentences with pronouns. Uh, they like to play games that are governed by rules. They're less fearful of their environment. They wor their worry is less profound, and they may begin losing their deciduous teeth. So even though they like playing by the rules, um, the difference between a five-year-old and a four-year-old is that they're going to accept losing better. A four-year-old doesn't really accept losing very well. Uh, by the time they're five, they're less egocentric and they have the beginning awareness of the outside world. So they're, they're starting to see things from others' perspectives. When we're egocentric, we can only see things from our perspective. Um, they should be encouraged to develop motor skills such as hammering a nail because that works on their hand-to-eye coordination. They should not be 
scorned for failure to meet adult standards and they must learn to do tasks themselves for experiencing for the experience um, to be satisfying. Cognitive development. So Piaget calls this the pre-operational phase, has two phases. There's the preconceptual, which occurs in two to four year old children, and then the intuitive thought, which occurs between five to seven years in um, years old in a child. So increasing development of language and symbolic functioning. So uh, symbolism is like using a box to represent a fort. Um, egocentric as they have difficulty seeing any point of view other than their own. They have animism and artificial artificialism. So symbolic function is seen in the play of children who pretend that an empty box is a fort. They create a mental image to stand for something that is really not there. Another characteristic of this period of egocentrism is a type of thinking where children have difficulty seeing any point of view other than their own. And that's because children's knowledge and understanding are very restricted to their own limited experiences that they've had. And also misconceptions can arise due to that. One misconception is animism. So this is a tendency to attribute life to an inanimate object. So kind of like in Home Alone where he feels like the broiler downstairs is alive. Um, Another is artificialism, which is the idea that people created the world and everything that is in it. Uh, Piaget's intuitive thought stage. This occurs between four to seven years of age. Um, so this is pre-logical thinking. So this is before they have logic, right? The experience and logic are based on outside appearances. Distinct characteristics is centering. So centering is where you can only focus on one aspect of that object. So tendency to concentrate on a singer, single outstanding characteristic of an object and exclude any other features. So if they ate broccoli one time and it was green any other vegetable that's green they may only focus on that it was green and they didn't like it and so therefore that is green i'm not going to like it effects of cultural practices this can influence the development of a sense of initiative parents and older siblings model language development so in reference to initiative because erickson's theory um, is during this stage is initiative versus guilt. That's between children that are three to five years of age. Um, so what happens with this is while playing, children begin to take initiative and they may attempt to feel out leadership roles and actions amongst their peers. For example, a child may choose the roles for themselves or others within a game. Uh, this is the beginning of initiative. The guilt comes into play when children make mistakes while navigating these positions learning the um, sub subtleties of getting others to cooperate without being bossy in trial and error. So guilt and shame in this situation can lead the child caring for others' feelings and choosing to do what others consider right, but it can also cause a child to avoid trying to, in to take the initiative in games or to lead others. This is also what Erickson refers to as the play ages. It's the time in life where children get a chance to take initiative through play. So children of play ages are usually in preschool for at least part of some day of the week or every day of the week. If not, they can still move through these stages successfully if they have opportunities to play with other children often. And they begin developing these interpersonal skills because they're now old enough to play with other children. So how do children take initiative? Well, children of play age are naturally drawn to experiences that allow them to make decisions and to lead other children. So as they play, they may choose a game to engage with others. They may choose their roles and even the roles that they play with others. Um, and when they're playing make believe. So during this stage, you might notice that children playing activities with their playmates, you may see um, them making up their games. Um, they may be one to suggest that the group plays the game or not play the game. 
Um, so they're not only practicing initiative, but they're developing their leadership skills too. So how do children develop guilt? Well, children in Erickson's stage can often seem aggressive and they simply haven't worked out the uh, subtleties of getting others to cooperate without being bossy. And they don't have the maturity always to choose appropriate games or roles for themselves or others. So in short, they're, short, they're going to make mistakes. So interacting with other children gives the child opportunities to develop a sense of initiative, but it also opens the doors for feelings of guilt. Um, so guilt can lead to healthy outcomes like caring for others' feelings and choosing to do what they, are con what they consider to be right. Um, and it can also cause the child to avoid trying to start new games or lead to others. So how do we find a balance between initiative and guilt? So initiative without guilt can be harmful to others. Guilt or shame without initiative can cause a child to withdraw from others. So a parent must try to subtly help their child find a proper balance between those two. So a parent has to be mindful and also be very delicate to avoid negative outcomes and taking over for the child. The child needs to learn to make those decisions on their own. So they, they need uh, space and they need to practice making those decisions and taking that initiative while also learning that they also have to consider other kids' feelings. Um, this is a good age um, for parents to be educated that it's important for children to learn to make their own mistakes at times. Um, and it's the parent's job to simply to point out this mistake and maybe provide education on a solution that they could try the next time. Um, so we have to make sure that the mistakes are corrected, but they're not considered bad. At this stage, children often take guilt or shame for things you never intended for them to carry. So we have to be really careful with that. Um, so the child may feel guilty for bothering you if you dismiss their question, yet at any parent will know that a child does not feel some sort of form of guilt when appropriate to learn to control themselves. So a child interrupting you to ask a question deserves a certain level of shame in order for them to realize that action, action has a negative social effect later in life. Language development. So delays or problems can be caused by uh, physiologic or psychological or environmental stressors. And so it includes both the understanding, so what someone is telling to them, they're able to comprehend that, or they're expressive, them being able to verbalize how they are feeling. We're gonna talk about some of the communication issues that might be problematic for this age group, whether it's not talking or maybe some of the terminology uh, that is described when we are talking about speech. Um, so a parent might say something to the effect of, I am the only one who understands what she says. So if that's the case, we're talking about articulation. Um, and then uh, someone might say, she'll do what I say, but she wants something, she just points. So she'll do what I say, but when she wants something, she'll just point. That's expressive language. It means they understand, but they can't express what they need. Um, he can't play, show me your nose, and the only word he says is mama. So that's usually a delay. We call that a global language delay. I might hear parents say, he never made those funny baby sounds or said mama or dada, and now he just repeats everything I say. So this is a language disorder. Um, so people that have autism can have that as well. Or you might hear parents say, he used to say things like, Joey, go bye-bye, but now he doesn't talk at all. So that's language loss. It's a regression. Those are things that we would be concerned about. Um, so sexual curiosity. So nurses use the following principles of teaching and learning common to other patients. 
Uh, so first you want to assess the knowledge base that the child has and then assess what specific information is the child really seeking. And you want to be honest and accurate in providing information at that particular child's level. Although the child may not understand completely at first, the child's repeated questions and explanations will form the basis of, of uh, later learning and understanding. You want to use correct terminology so that misinformation and misinterpretation can be avoided. You want to provide sex education at the time the child asks a question. Uh, the asking of the question often indicates a readiness to learn. Parents must understand that sexual curiosity starts with an inquiry into the anatomical differences. So basically understanding why do females have a vagina and why do males have a penis? It's basically that. It's not a sexual thing. It's wanting to know the anatomical differences between them. Um, so they want to know the difference in how urination occurs, and that may be the later of, of the focus. And general understanding of infants coming from mommy's tummy precedes the more mature concept of the sexual organs and functioning of how the baby got into the tummy. You know, so I remember with one of my kids, they were asking me how the baby got in my tummy. And I think maybe this child was three or four years old. So basically I just said, mommy has eggs and daddy has tadpoles. And when the eggs and the tadpoles get together, it it makes a baby, just like when we put seeds in the ground and then we put the soil on top of it and water it, we get a plant. And so they were kind of, you know, satisfied with that answer. And so I'm not really lying about how the baby gets there. They didn't want to know the process of which it happened. They wanted to know how the baby gets in there and then it grows. Um, so sexual curiosity. As a nurse, you want to make sure that you assess what the, the knowledge of the base already knows. So tell me, what do you know about how the baby gets a mommy's tummy? Or what do you know about why daddy has a penis and mommy has a vagina? Um, and then also you want to assess what specific information is the child seeking. Then you want to be honest and accurate. You want to use the correct terminology. You want to provide sex education at the time the child asks questions, not I'll tell you later when you're older. You can provide a simple explanation. And then parents must understand that sexual curiosity starts with an inquiry into the anatomical differences. Um, my father-in-law used to be a family court judge, and so sometimes he would have to deal with, you know, uh, kids being removed from the home, and that could even be something related to incest or sexual abuse. And so one of the things that he has always instilled in his kids is to make sure that we teach the children the proper terminology for the anatomical sexual uh, organs in the body. And that is because if something were to ever happen and the child were to refer to their private part as a flower and then they were to go to court, people have gotten off of the of being in trouble because um, or being prosecuted because they couldn't uh, they couldn't prove that the child was referring to their private genitalia as the flower. So I've always taught my kids the proper terminology that women have vaginas or girls have vaginas and boys have penises for that reason. Um, so sexual curiosity. Preschool children are, as a matter of fact, about sex, sexual investigations as they are about other learning experiences and are easily distracted by other activities um, that may be displayed in a form of masturbation. So this is actually considered harmless if the child is outgoing, if they're sociable, um, or if they're preoccupied, or if they're not preoccupied with the activity. Um, you want to assure parents that this is normal behavior. So a lot of times when kids are doing this, it's a self-soothing issue, but we need to teach them appropriate behaviors and that that type of behavior needs to be done in private. Um, as a nurse, um, we could easily distract the child um, from, by um, providing a distraction with doing another type of an activity. So sexual curiosity is usually displayed in forms of masturbation 
Um, like you'll hear people talk about playing doctor, um, but we want to make sure that we don't, um, we want to teach them what is appropriate behavior and what is inappropriate behavior. Um, so the appropriate touch or dress can be taught without uh, generating a bad or a dirty concept to that particular activity. So teaching socially acceptable behaviors must be in the form of guidance rather than in discipline, you know, and that's not okay to do here. If you need to do that, you need to go in your room or in the bathroom by yourself. We don't do that in front of other people. Uh, bedtime habits. So you want to engage a child in quiet activities before bedtime, establish and maintain specific rituals that signal bedtime readiness, attention getting behaviors that results in taking the child into the parent's bed. And it should be discouraged because then we're often, off, we're often rewarding the bad behavior. So it rewards the attention getting behavior and it defeats the objectives at bedtime um, for those rituals. So physical, mental, and emotional and social development. So the three-year-old, um, they have parallel play where they play side by side. They're not really interacting with each other, but they want to be by each other and they'll just play in their own little with their in their own little world. Then you have associative play. And then they're able to begin helping with household chores. They begin to lose some interest in the mother and the father's prestige starts to increase. Um, and that is generally because when babies are younger, they rely on their mother a lot because mom is their source of food and comfort and usually the main care provider. Um, they can become angry when others try to take what they believe is theirs. Physical and mental, emotional and social development. So for the four year old, they're more aggressive. They like to show off their new acquired skills. Always reminds me of like Stuart from I don't know if it was Mad TV or in Living Color, and he'd always, when his mom would have somebody over, would be like, look what I could do, right? Those are kids. Uh, they always want other the attention from others. Um, they can use scissors. They can tie their shoelaces. Um, vocabulary, um, they, it's up to 1,500 words. They're more interested in the raw materials rather than ready-made toys. So, for example, you buy a toy, right? It comes in a huge box. And then after you put the toy together, they want to play with the box. Um, so stories with simple plots are interesting. Concepts of death become more real. So answering questions to help accept the truth without um, undue fear. Physical and mental, emotional and social development. So the five-year-old, they're more responsible, less dependent on parent for bathing and dressing, talks a lot, questions many things and seeks answers. They can ride a tricycle, use simple tools such as a hammer with adult supervision and better comprehension of the computer games and television, uh, moderate time for doing both. So we don't want kids to be on the television or an electronic device. They need to be using their imagination and discovering their world through play. Uh, guidance, discipline, and self-limiting. So children need limits for their behavior. Uh, teach and gradually shift controls from parent to child. Self-discipline or self-control. Time timing the timeout. So if when we initiate timeouts, it should be one minute per year of age, no interaction or eye contact during the timeout. Um, so uh, if you've ever seen the super nanny, right? That's usually what she does. You pick the child up, put them back in timeout and you don't engage with the child. Um, so after the timeout, you should have a discussion with the child down at their eye level, explain to them why they, were, why they were in timeout and how they could handle the situation differently next time. Um, you want to reward good behavior. So you don't want to confuse this with bribes, right? So um, you want to encourage positive behavior and you can do that with a reward. So for example, if you're going to Target before you go into the store, you would tell your child, if you are good through the store, when we leave, I will let you pick out a treat, okay? That's a different that's different than bribing a child bribing a child would be that you're in the store the child's having a fit and then as they're having a fit you tell them if you be good then I will get this for you that is a bribe and that's rewarding bad behavior so you don't want to do that uh, consistency is very important and modeling the behavior is very important um, it significantly influences a child behavior so if you have a temper tantrum about them having a temper tantrum then you're not modeling good behavior 
So jealousy, this is a normal response to actual supposed or threatened loss of affection. Uh, jealousy of a new sibling is strongest in children that are under five years of age. And it may revert to behave behaviors that were seen at an earlier age, like wetting the bed, wanting to drink out of a sippy cup after they're already drinking out of a regular cup or a bottle. They may be aggressive, bite or pinch, so you need to watch them around a new sibling. Uh, they tend to be seen less in, in only children. Uh, so if a child um, is an only child, they don't have jealousy quite as often because they've had a lot of mom and dad's attention and attention from other adults. Uh, children should feel they are helping with the care of other siblings. Thumb sucking, so instinctual behavior patterns. So finger or thumb sucking will not have a detrimental effect on the teeth as long as the habit is discontinued before the permanent teeth erupt. The child who is trying to stop th thumb sucking should be given praise and encouragement. Um, it may regress during, they may regress during periods of stress and fatigue. So remember when they're sucking their thumb, it's usually for soothing measures. So if they're tired or if they're feeling stressed or anxious, they may resort back to that same behavior. Um, and again, usually no issue with them sucking their thumb as long as we can discontinue that habit or break the habit prior to their teeth erupting. Um, I was always a big fan of the pacifier because it's easy to throw a pacifier away. You can't throw a child's thumb away, right? So in uresis, this is bedwetting. Um, so primary in uresis means the child has never been dry while sleeping at night. So secondary means the bedwetting reoccurrence in a child who has been dry for a period of a year or more, and then all of a sudden starts wetting the bed again. If that happens, we're concerned there might be a cause behind it. It could be um, physiologic with the body. Um, it might be due to infection. It could be due to a disease. Um, and unfortunately can also be related to abuse. And so we have to watch for these things. Bedwetting is more common in boys than it is girls. So organic causes would be a urinary tract infection, diabetes mellitus or diabetes insipitus, uh, seizures, obstructive uropathy, abnormalities of the, of the urinary tract, and then also sleep disorders. Um, so in uresis, uh, treatment and nursing care, uh, we're gonna first um, collect data regarding um, the history of it and how often, the pattern of wetting the number of times per night or week, the number of daytime voidings and the type of strain, that's probably more for a boy, dysuria, so any um, pain with urination, the amount of fluid taken between dinner and bedtime, if there's any family history of it, if there's stress going on like a divorce or um, another type of stress, uh, medications, developmental landmarks, including toilet training. When did that all happen? Those are things that we want to collect as a nurse. The child needs to be the center of the management program. So liquids should be limited after dinner and a child should avoid, should avoid before going to bed and treatment options should be counseling, hypnosis, behavior modification, pharmacotherapy, and then bladder training exercises to stretch and increase the bladder. There's also preschool programs, so structured activities, and we wanna foster group cooperation, the development of coping skills, and um, we want the child to gain confidence, self-confidence and positive self-esteem um, from this program. So those are the things we should be looking for in a preschool, and we should be teaching parents that they need to look for in a preschool. So daycare. Uh, does not require extensive physical care, but still needs to bathe each day and shampoo hair um, at least twice a day. I think I said daycare, I meant daily care, sorry. And then clothing should be loose enough to prevent restriction of movement, should be washable, sturdy, and supportive, because we're trying to teach them to be as independent as possible at this age. Um, so accident prevention, these kids tend to be hurt more by or uh, injured by accidents. So we wanna make sure we prevent those things from happening. So accidents are the major threat for three to five year olds. So car safety is essential. They need to be sitting in the correct type of restraint in the car. 
Burns occur due to the child's experimentation. So that could be with matches. It could be with a lighter. Um, it could be with cooking. Poisoning can occur due to increased freedom and access to items within the environment. And the child should be taught about the dangers of talking to or getting in the car with strangers, as well as dangers of playing in secluded areas. Um, also, indirect supervision is necessary due to their poor judgment. Play in health and in illness. So the value of play. That is the job of a child. They're gonna learn everything about their world through play. So it's important for the physical play, also mental play, emotional and social development. It increases communication uh, with other children. So that's how they learn to socialize is through play as well. The nurse's role in uh, play is, is important as well. We wanna make sure that that is included in the child's plan of care and it should be age appropriate. Just because they're in the hospital and they're sick doesn't mean they lay in the hospital bed all day long. They need to have play and have the ability to go to the playroom if necessary and socialize with other kids. And then if not, then we're still seeking out things that would stimulate them mentally, physically, and emotionally in their room. So factors to consider is the patient's state of health, um, if they're overstimulated or fatigued, um, depending on the, t the illness that they have, uh, the development should be considered when choosing a toy for the child. So just because a child's 12 doesn't mean they get a 12 year old toy if their mental capacity is an, at the age of an eight year old. So the types of play for preschool children should be non-competitive and that's because they're poor losers. Um, so you want to help the child adjust to the expanding world and increase independence. So uh, going to the playroom or teaching parents to get them involved in playing with other children is really important. Um, so nursing tip, imaginary playmates are common and normal during the preschool period and serve many purposes, such as a relief from loneliness, mastery of feats, and also a, a scapegoat, right? Can blame it on the imaginary friend, it wasn't them. Uh, so play and the child with a neurodevelopmental sensory or motor disorder. So repetition of play experience is necessary. Mentally disabled child needs more stimulation through play than the child who is not impaired. Um, consider mental um, ability and not the chronological age. Um, play needs to be supervised due to poor judgment and a potential for aggressive behavior with this age group. Therapeutic play. So this helps to retrain their muscles and improve hand and eye coordination. And it helps children to crawl and then also to walk. Um, and other types of play um, would be play therapy. So this is used when the child is under stress. It allows an opportunity for them to express how they feel and work through those emotions. Also art therapy, a child can express feelings and communicate with others through drawings. So play therapy is used for children that are under stress. We can um, use the playroom and sometimes a counselor is in attendance, um, can help observe their play, kind of see what they're going through. Um, and work with the child and play with the child so that they're able to express how they feel and through play give them ideas on how to manage their their uh, stress and provide better coping mechanisms. It also helps the child to play out their fears. So art therapy, this means communication between the child and the adult. So if you if the child were to draw a sad face on their picture, it may be how they're feeling and so you can kind of talk about that oh i noticed that in this uh, what's this a picture of this is a picture of me um you look sad in the picture tell me about this picture and then maybe they can express how they feel that way so choose to express their feelings and and a way to communicate and they do so through their drawings and it may even be through other artworks like clay or other forms of art media So nursing implications of preschool growth and development. So you want to provide parental guidance concerning the changing behavior patterns of the preschool age child, because there's a huge difference between three to six years of age. Um, so the use of timeouts and alternative methods of discipline should be stressed. 
Uh, we don't want to be yelling at the child or spanking them because they're already aggressive anyway and they already have tantrums and so we need to be modeling good behaviors. Um, so hospitalization um, can be very frightening for a child. They may perceive the hospitalization as a form of punishment. So it's really important as a nurse that they that we teach them that they didn't do anything wrong and that's not why they're sick and in the hospital. Also, child may feel abandoned if they're sick and parents may have their have other kids at home and so they have to go home and take care of their other kids or work or whatever um, because if they don't work, maybe um, they're the provider of insurance and so they might lose their insurance and this can lead a child to feel abandoned. So we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. Separation anxiety can be manifested by stages of protest. First, they don't want the parents to leave and they're um, fighting against them leaving and then despair. They, they're feeling helpless and that they, they can't um, have their parents with them and they're feeling lost. Uh, then the next part is detachment. So they're, it's like a coping mechanism where they're not going to let themselves feel uh, bad about their parents leaving. And then this can also cause a regression to earlier behaviors. Um, so things that they've um, already overcome, like toilet training or, um, you know, uh, sucking their thumb, something to that effect. Nursing implications of preschool for growth and development. So important nursing assessments includes observing the child. So uh, what is the child's approach to play? Does the child join in freely or linger outside of the group? Does a child prefer active or quiet play? Can the child talk with his or her playmates and convey any ideas? And what type of attention span does the child have? So these are things that we want to consider when uh, we are working with children and their families. This concludes our lecture on the preschool child. Thank you.